Good morning. Please stand in body or spirit and join me in our call to worship. Jesus said, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and we hear the shepherd's voice. He calls his own by name and leads us out. When he brings out all of his own, he goes ahead, and we follow because we know his voice. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters by Christ will be saved. Jesus came that we may have life. He came that we may have life self-deceived, and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sins before Almighty God. Almighty God, you love us abundantly, but we have not loved you fully. The voice of Christ our Shepherd calls us, but we do not always listen. We walk, walk away from our neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We often condone evil, prejudice, hatred, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. to condemn. Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and a new life has begun. My Christian friends, in the person of Jesus Christ, we stand justified, we stand sanctified, and our sins are forgiven. like to have the children down the children side of this time with me. Talk today a little bit about 
being fair, all right? Do you think it's important to be fair? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I do. I know that you do. I think that you know that it's important to be fair. And so I thought that we might try and be fair today. And so to be fair, I brought some candy, okay? Is it okay if you all have some candy? Yeah, I think, yeah, all right. All right, and I'm gonna try and divvy this candy up as fairly as possible. So here's one for Aruba. There we go, one for you. I have a gummy. And then here's one for Grace. And here's one for Sophie, and here's one for me, and then there's one left, and so that'll go to me. Okay. Was that fair? No. No, nope, that wasn't fair. You have two. I ha oh, I do have two, and you all have one, so that's not fair. Okay, well, um, how can we make it fair? You can get away so, the one you have. <laughs> I can put this. You can get away one of them that you have. Oh, I have to get rid of one. Or, or, oh, okay, here we go. What if I give, uh, give one to you? I so now you have one. two, and now you have two, and now you have two, and I have two. Is that fair? Yes. yes. Okay, it's, oh, but wait. Uh-oh. <laughs> Look at all, those people don't get any. Is, that, is it really fair we get two and they don't have any? No. <laughs> uh oh, oh, yeah. okay. Well, all right, so let's look here and see. I'm looking, oh, I don't know that. I don't think I have enough to give everybody. Oh, oh, I know what's fair, I know what's fair. All right, everybody hand them in and nobody gets any. And, <laughs> and now that's how we do it fairly. So nobody gets any candy. Is this, does that seem like the way we should do it? No. No? Okay. Oh, well, we got to figure this out, don't we? Oh, and you know what? Those people maybe, are maybe, maybe we shouldn't be trying to be fair. Maybe we should try to be loving. And if we're loving, then I say, all right, here's two for you. All right, and here's two for you. And here's two for you. All right, and then... I think that they might understand that it would be loving to let you all have this candy, <laughs> right? And they would be all right if you had it and they didn't get any because even though that would be fair for everybody to have some, you know, we can't really be all the way fair because there's people over there in the Methodist church, there's people in the Baptist church, there's people who didn't go to church today and I can't give everybody two pieces of candy. I can't, because I just can't do it. I don't have enough. Mm -hmm. All right. All so packages. maybe what we need to focus on, instead of being fair, is how can we be loving, all right? And so I'm going to give you this candy because I love you, and I think that they would be all right with you having the candy because they love you, all right? And you know, and the way it works, right? If we we might think we're being fair, but if we increase our scope and pull back and look, what's fair for a small group maybe isn't fair for everybody, and it's it's almost impossible to be fair to what? everybody at the same time. And you know who's the only person who could be fair to everyone? God. It would be God. God's the only one who knows what's going on in everybody's life. God's the only one who can see absolutely everything and know what is fair. And do you know what God decided? What? God decided it's more important to be loving than, than it is to be fair. Okay? Does that make sense? Another no, <laughs> you're pushing it. You're pushing it. All right, let's pray and thank God for that. All right, I'll say some words you repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God. Help, us help us not to be too caught up on what's fair. Not to be too caught and instead, and to focus on what's loving. To focus on what's loving. All right, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now you can head down to Children's Worship with Miss Judy or back with your parents if you'd like to do that. Thank
As God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by the proclamation of the word. Let us pray. Gracious God, once again we come before your throne, your graciousness, your seat of mercy and love. Recognizing that we of our own merits fall short to even approach you, yet by the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the indwelling of your Spirit, you have made it possible for us to be reckoned as righteous in your sight. Speak to us, your faithful people, your sacred word. Speak to us beyond the sacred page. Speak to us in our hearts. Write your words into our souls so that we may be so transformed by your grace and love spoken to us this day that we may actually take upon ourselves the incarnation of your Son himself, that we may continue his work, that we as your church may be the hands and feet, the heart, the love of Jesus Christ for all whom we encounter. Speak to us this word this day. We pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. The main uh, lection for today, uh, for today's uh, uh, proclamation, is uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. But before I read that, I want to read the gospel reading that's also assigned for the day because they will tie in. Uh, this is, uh, the gospel reading is uh, the gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Uh, it is uh, a tradition on the fourth Sunday of Eastertide to uh, read from, the, uh, from chapter 10 of John's Gospel. Uh, fourth, uh, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide is always considered uh, Shepherd Sunday. And uh, you'll see in this passage, of course, this is where uh, Jesus begins to introduce himself as the Good Shepherd and the allegory that he offers uh, to his disciples in this particular message. Uh, so uh, let me start with the, the gospel, and then I want to read from 1 Peter following. Uh, in uh, John chapter 10, listen for the word of God. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd. Of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, <coughs> and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep will not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And here now, this reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through uh, 25. Uh, here, 1 Peter is addressing the Christian community. And by the way, you've heard me say this before with regard to the, uh, the epistle of 1 Peter. It is a late writing in, uh, in comparison to the other books that are in our New Testament. Uh, 1 Peter is uh, probably early 2nd century. Uh, so what we're noticing in this letter is that Christians by this time uh, have, um, uh, it, it, the Christianity has been around long enough now that Christianity is just a commonplace thing in family households, uh, as is indicated in what you're going to see in this particular passage. Uh, the lectionary calls for the reading uh, to start at verse 19, 
But I will, uh, as I go through in the sermon, you're going to see why I really think that it should have started at 18, but I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. With that as an introduction, I want you to hear how uh, 1 Peter is addressing Christians who have to undergo persecution and suffering for the sake of their faith in this uh, Greco-Roman world in which most Christians are living at the time. Listen once again for the word of God. For it is a commendable thing if, being aware of God, a person endures pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do good and suffer for it, that is a commendable thing before God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who, judge, who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Amen, and may God give us to understand this, these readings of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. The reading of the epistle lesson uh, this morning we might assume that 1 Peter uh, is directly addressing Christians who are suffering um, unjustly because of their faith. And uh, they're, they're suffering unjustly because of their discipleship in Jesus Christ. But if you would read the, the earlier verse, verse 18, you would see something perhaps a little bit shocking from the context in which it's written. 1 Peter is not addressing Christians in general who are suffering for their faith. If you read verse 18, you discover he's addressing household slaves. That's who he's talking to. Household slaves who are suffering unjustly at the hands of their masters. That's what's going on in this passage. I simply want to make it clear that... Uh, that sometimes when we, when we pick up Scripture and read it just by picking the particular verses that we want to read, sometimes we miss the larger context of Scripture. This is addressed to slaves. You and I may have difficulty understanding that because we live in a world where uh, slavery is, we would consider, taboo. Though we have to admit we have an ownership in it in our lives, it's part of our culture, at least part of our history, excuse me, and we are still, we are still working through the consequences of slavery in the United States. We still deal with this as a reality. But that said, I want to take a look at why the lectionary puts this and reads this for us the way it does. First Peter, though addressing household slaves, is doing so recognizing that the household slave is serving as a paradigm for all of Christianity. And we know this because if you, uh, uh, jumping back even two other verses to chapter 2, verse 16, he writes, all uh, as slaves of God, not just addressing household slaves, in this case he's now talking about all, of, uh, all Christians, calling them all slaves, slaves of God. As slaves of God, Live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Christian freedom lives out Christ's freedom. 
We are made free. Now, by the way, what's interesting about 1 Peter is that it also reflects the same kind of theology we find in Paul's writings. And that is, Paul believes that, that, uh, that everyone is a slave of one form or another. He says as such. Paul believes that we are freed by the grace of God, but, once, uh, but freed not for doing things, but from what we have been enslaved to. The interesting thing about the entire biblical witness is when it talks about freedom, it's not talking about the kind of, of um, freedom in, in American independence that you and I seem to prize. We talk about our various freedoms that the Constitution gives us. Uh, freedom for doing this or that. Freedom uh, for speech. Freedom for practicing our religion. Uh, various uh, Freedom to assemble and to address the government for, with redress for our own concerns and protest. These are the various freedoms we talk about in the Constitution. Paul knows nothing about that kind of freedom. He doesn't think in terms of freedom for doing things. He thinks of freedom from a certain kind of enslavement. Not freedom for, but freedom from. That's the kind of freedom that Scripture witnesses to. That kind of freedom is one where... Uh, we are either freed from sin, but by consequence, we are slaves to God. Now, we could be freed from God and then be a slave of sin, which Paul believes is the natural state of human beings. Paul believes human beings are slaves to sin without Christ. That's who we are. We are trapped in sin, save for Jesus Christ. So... The metaphor used here about being free or being enslaved applies if we think in terms of being enslaved to something, either enslaved to God in Jesus Christ or enslaved to our, our base nature as human beings, enslaved to sin, enslaved to the powers of evil. Christian freedom lives out Christ's freedom, and Christ's freedom did not include a freedom to repay evil for evil. He offers us a freedom to pay good for evil. Because I am God's slave, I am free not to resist violence with violence, to match, to fight fire with fire. That is not the Christian way, according to 1 Peter. Meeting evil for evil. That's just a bunch of evil, my Christian friends. That's just a lot of evil. The Bible is not supporting that. Paul doesn't support that. First Peter does not support that. Jesus Christ most certainly did not support that. Jesus Christ did not take up arms against Rome. He died on the cross. He met evil with good. First Peter addresses the people with a certain... Uh, What's the word? Christology. I'm going to go ahead and impress you with a, a big 50-cent word, my Christian friends. Christology. Again, use that to impress your friends at a cocktail party. Uh, what is Christology? It's simply um, the things we have to say about Jesus Christ, the doctrines of Christ, the theology of Christ. He has a, there's a certain Christology, if you will, about 1 Peter, a certain understanding of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter is influenced by the servant song. The suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53. That's what he's quoting here in the, the scriptural reference we had here. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. That's Isaiah 53 verse 9. This is how he understands Jesus Christ. He is the suffering servant. By his wounds we are healed. By his suffering we have been saved. He meets evil with good. What would he have accomplished by taking up the sword against Rome? We'd still be lost. We would still be lost sheep, even though he would have a perfect right to do so. Jesus would have had a perfect right to take himself off the cross. He didn't deserve to be there, but he doesn't. He suffers for our sake and thereby provides present, uh, a, a present grace and eternal redemption. 
And what's also important, this is the Christology that he's talking about. Christ is the, uh, the faithful, suffering servant. But what's important for, for 1 Peter is it's not just that he does that, it's that he has done that before we do it. He's already gone through it. He has set the example, and this is the phrase that's used here in the text, Jesus Christ is the example. That's why it makes that very fascinating statement here that we should follow in his steps. Very similar to Jesus in the Gospels telling us, telling his disciples, you too have to take up your cross. We all have to take up our cross. That's the cost of discipleship. But we live in a Christianity which basically embraces its comfort. We do. We know we do, my Christian friends. It's, uh, it, it's sometimes painful to recognize that, that Christianity has become, in, at least in American culture, it's become complacent. And we've, we've come to believe that all we need to do is just come to church and hear the Word of God, call Jesus our Savior, and that's the extent of our faith. We receive the salvation, and it doesn't cost us anything. When in fact, that, uh, we, we treat it as though that means that somehow or that the salvation that I received from Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he made by paying the price for my, our sins, that somehow or other that just takes each and every one of us finally to the finish line. We're done. That's it. I'm saved. I've reached the apex of Christianity. <laughs> That's how Christianity today seems to live. We don't want to be inconvenienced by the discomfort of reaching out in concern for the marginalized, speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves, feeding those who can't feed themselves, welcoming the stranger when no one else will. No, my Christian friends, salvation is not the end of the race. Salvation is the beginning of the race, putting us all at the start of the, start, the, the, uh, the line when we would have otherwise been disqualified by our sins. Salvation is the beginning of salvation. And, and that makes sense to say. Eternal life is the beginning of our salvation. Not the end. It makes it possible for us to run the race without being condemned for our sins. Now, by the way, if you stop to think about it, this is why it's called taking up your cross. Because this is not a comfortable position to be in. To do the right thing means that I'm not going to be paying evil for evil. It means that I'm in for a tough, long haul. The Christians that 1 Peter is writing to are suffering because of their faith. We're called to do no different. I would, I would submit to you, my Christian friends, that, that Christianity today, the church today, is a great place for Christians to hide. It is a great place for Christians to hide. Because we put on the garb of looking like we are Christ people. But we go out into the world, we don't look like Christ at all. Because it would cost us to do so. The cross is not just our salvation, it is that. The cross is also our example following in his steps. And by the way, I want to make clear that 1 Peter and Jesus and Paul and all who are part of their proclamations in Scripture are not necessarily saying that you too have to be crucified. But taking up your cross means that you've got to step out of your comfort. You've got to put your salvation into practice. You, even if that means some suffering, that's the cost of discipleship. This is what 1 Peter is saying to the Christians. Yes, they are suffering for their faith. Don't give up. Don't meet evil for evil. Don't match fire with fire. Do good when people do not show goodness to you. Love even those who will not love you back. Give even for those who are ungrateful. And you're thinking, what does that get me? <laughs> it doesn't get you anything. That's the point. That is exactly the point. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about me. 
It's about Jesus Christ. And by the way, I want you to know, as I'm sitting, I'm sitting up here preaching to you as though somehow other, and I don't want this to come across as though I'm, I'm condemning. I'm preaching to myself as well. I can guarantee you, my Christian friends, I am still a bundle of selfishness myself. I really am. I struggle with my spirituality, but I know that's the right thing. I know it's the right thing. Think about the sacrifice. Here are some examples that I can tell you. I've read up a few of these that I thought were examples of what it means to take up your cross. Despite the, the comfortable Christian culture, Christian culture that we, uh, we live in, we can still find examples of people who take up their own respective crosses. There's a story of a young man who quit a lucrative job in a major mer uh, uh, merchandising uh, chain because it was, it, it was involved in shady uh, uh, marketing practices. And they wanted him to acquiesce. He quit rather than to give in. Side note, by the way, I've left two positions in ministry precisely because of that. Um, I know it may sound strange, but even the church is not free of sin. Um, I was asked to do some things in my very first position as a, a minister that uh, uh, were not, in my opinion, Christ-like. I, I, I could not take it. I had to leave that position. It's what you have to do. There's a story of a Chinese student who came to the United States uh, to study law and was able to find an apartment in the Divinity School. And while there, uh, she became uh, uh, connected to a Bible study and became Christian. But because of her outspokenness in her Christianity, she was never welcomed back in her Chinese society, and she was um, um, ostracized by her Chinese family. There is a story I know of of, an, of a congregation that made the explicit intention to welcome gays and lesbians into their community as part of their, their, uh, their, their Christian life. And their denomination cut ties with that congregation precisely because they decided to uh, open their doors to someone that that particular denomination would not itself welcome. That's the kind of sacrifice, that's the kind of taking up the cross that is an example of what it means to be Christ-like in the world. Christ's cross does not always protect us from our own crosses. What Christ's cross does do is it frees us from enslavement to sin and the compulsion to evil. What does he say here at the end of this passage in 1 Peter? For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Sin and evil which one, uh, which is once enslaved us, as allegorized by, by Christ in, in John chapter 10. Sin and, and evil are allegorized as the thieves and bandits who break into the sheepfold by another way, not entering by the gate. But Christ, the good shepherd, rescues us from the thief. He rescues us as the guardian of our souls. Following the Good Shepherd may not be easy. As the sheep follow Christ, you know, we always portray it as though it's a beautiful pastoral scene, but sometimes it's over rocky soil, being as sheep following Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. It may not be easy, and discipleship, bearing one's cross, is never easy. But because we are owned by the Good Shepherd, and He hears, uh, we recognize His voice, He recognizes us. We are not possessed by the death of sin. We are not possessed by the bandit or the thief. We are not trapped in returning evil for evil. We're freed from that. I mean, now, the, the, here's the trick. The, uh, freedom also means you are free to go ahead and do that. But why do you want to look like you're not saved when you already are, my Christian friends? If you have the freedom not to sin, why do you do it? Why do you want to look like it? If you're saved, why do you want to look like you're not? We are, that's the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. We are freed from the, the compulsion, the power of sin. We're freed from it. I do not. It's hard, but I do not have to be evil for evil. I do not. 
through following the Good Shepherd may be hard, may be unjust, but we have life and we have it abundantly. Amen and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. reaffirm our Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
And again, at this point in our service of worship, we're blessed to have a, uh, a word again uh, about the uh, needs assessment that's coming up in a few in a few weeks. Uh, and uh, Bonnie, have that word for us. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about something other than money. Can you believe it? I think you've probably all figured out by now that the session is up to the task of talking with you all about the assessment that's going to happen, the all-church congregation assessment opportunity that's going to happen on May 21st. And we want... Uh, the entire congregation to get involved in this, and we're hoping that the entire congregation will get involved in the work of the church with enthusiasm. No small hope, right? But I was thinking today that it would be easier for us all to participate on the 21st if we really had in mind how the work of our church is organized. This is a very dull topic. And so I'm afraid you're all going to go home and say, Bonnie Gray gave the worst talk today I've ever heard her give. Um, but I'm going to try to make it interesting. How many people serve on the session? Who knows the answer to that and the session may not say? How many? Winnie? Nine, that's right, nine people out of the whole congregation serve on the session. How many committees is the session divided into? Too many. Too many? <laughs> now, wait again. Six. Nine members, six committees. So some of the committees of the session have two members leading and some have only one. Does that sound fair? No joke? <laughs> well, it isn't really because every one of these committees is in charge of a lot of things and many of the things we are in charge of are things that emanate from the congregation. That's what we want you to do. We want you to come up with some other ideas maybe that will generate more enthusiasm among all of us than the ones we've been doing. I mean, the first committee is called administration. And that's led by Bill Mitchell and Jim Exline. And they deal with the budget every year, putting it together and doing evaluations of the staff. I can't think of anything more boring than that. <laughs> Personally, that would not be where I belong if I'm serving on the session. But I know there are some of you here who have expertise and talents to put budgets together and so on. And we have had in the past members of the congregation who came to those meetings and helped. You see, the committees aren't just for those members of the session who chair them, they're for everyone. Anyone who wants to be on a committee can and actually should, because if you're not, we can't function. The next committee is Christian education. And right now, the members are led by Jed Deaton and Courtney Lawrence, who's still attending by Zoom. And they're in charge of things like the Sunday school program, the preschool, the youth program, Bible studies. They need a lot of help. And look at all the retired teachers and current teachers we have in this congregation. And other kinds of folks with expertise that could be put to use on that committee. Fellowship is the third committee, and that is led by David Deaton all by himself. <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> and this used to be a committee that got us all together on Wednesday nights, and we had dinners and programs, among other things. And right now, we're trying to have 
a potluck every second Wednesday, and you know what? It's not going very well. I don't know why we are not enthusiastic about potlucks right now, but we're not. And so maybe it's time for that to go and something else to come, or maybe it's time that it add another wrinkle to it. Or maybe programming needs to come back. I don't know what the answer is, but under that committee, we do church picnics. And the last church picnic at Sue's house was a huge success. Thank you, Sue, for hosting it. And so that's a keeper, I think. And we're planning <laughs> for another one for this summer. And that's something you're enthused about, OK? Then comes missions committee. That's my committee. And Beth Underwood's committee. So there are two of us. But if you think of all the things that we're responsible for, we couldn't possibly do it by ourselves. And luckily, we don't have to. There's the Peter Marshall dinner. And that's under leadership of Linda. Right? Linda Adams. And she has a big group to help. And people seem to love that mission. And they volunteer to help with it. There's the Giving Tree Ministry for the New Liberty Shelter. And that's another one that the congregation seems to really like. And why not? Giving to families who are almost homeless and have small and teenage children and everything like that. What would be more fun than that? And we really get into it. There's the No Room in the Inn ministry. And Jennifer Brubaker organizes us, usually, for that. And the, there's enough people that get into that. Do you know that there are people in this congregation who enjoy staying up all night? <laughs> and monitoring those who come. And there are always lots of people needed to cook. And boy, we have the cooks here in this congregation. And there's laundry to do. And we even have someone in this congregation who loves to do laundry. That would be me. I just don't get any ideas, so I'm not taking in any more laundry. But that's another opportunity to serve in the mission garden. That's probably our newest, most exciting ministry. And it could go a long way. It could do so many things. And it will. I mean, if you look over there right now, look how organized the garden is. Jen Deacon is enthused about leading us in that ministry. And so get on board if you like to plant and harvest and so on. Property, that's the fifth one. That's led by Eric Everett all by himself. <laughs> Again, is that sound fair? I, that's a, I mean, it's the whole physical plant, for heaven's sakes. He needs a lot of people on that committee, helping. The Tuesday crew has been a big part of that effort, and their numbers have been seriously diminished. And when Don and Sandy Dixon left, what a gap that's been on the Tuesday crew. And women can be on that <laughs> Tuesday crew, too, and have been. Pam and Dale Lawrence were members of that committee forever. So don't use the excuse, oh, well, they just need men who can hammer and saw. No, that's not true. And then there's the worship committee, led by David Jeff. Another one that just has one leader. But if you were to come to a meeting of that committee, you would see about a 10 to 12 people around the table every time. People like to turn up for that committee. And they do, and they have their niche in it, let's say. Kitty Shu has been taking care of communion in our worship service for a long time. Thank you, Kitty. And 
the two Davids had eaten a Jeremy fixing the communion table elements for a long time now. And Sue Jack, look at that wonderful table cover she made that we saw. Was it last week or the week before? Anyway, she's going to make some more. And there's just room. And so I guess the bottom line of this talk is get involved, understand that you can propose ideas that take some of the things we're doing in another direction or take them off the agenda and that you can propose some brand new things that might sound really outrageous at the time, certainly not to you if you propose it, but it's something that we'll strive for, right? And some people will get excited. I still don't see a whole lot of excitement out there. Just we've <laughs> got to get excited. So thanks for listening. I'm sure it was longer than a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say, uh, Bonnie, that was uplifting. Thank you. And it was a, a, a very uh, nice breakdown of uh, all the, uh, the arms of the session as they're trying to do their work. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I let me concur that uh, uh, we, uh, we need the congregation in order to make the session's work, which is the congregation's work, work. Uh, and uh, perhaps that will be a great opportunity through the needs assessment for us to uh, 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 consider what ideas we're doing are good, which ones can be adjusted, what, uh, or what new ones can we entertain. Just a, just a great idea for the congregation to have its input in, uh, in the life of the church in this way. So, uh, Bonnie, thank you very much. Um, okay. Let's come before God in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that you will continually abide in us and lead us. Remind us that we are sheep who have gone astray. Be our good shepherd, guiding and directing us in the way of what truth and of life. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who, despite our waywardness, never gives up on us. May we faithfully follow, and even when we stumble, may we find our way back by the grace of your Son. This we pray in Christ's most holy name, he who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, we are given the opportunity to recognize God's sacrifice for us, the good shepherd who has given his life for the sheep. Uh, that is his sacrifice for us. It is always appropriate to, to worship God by our respective sacrifices in return for God and for one another. Uh, be mindful of this as we meditate in our giving and our sacrifices during the time of the offertory.
Remind us that his all is the good shepherd who is also the lamb who was slain for our goodness, for our redemption, for our hope of eternal life, for our hope of faithful service to you and one another. Receive, we pray, our sacrifices offered this day as a sign of our love, our mutual love for you, our mutual love for one another. May these offerings, these gifts, be a sign of your continued love for this world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brought again from the dead our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us for all good gifts that we may be about the work of God now and forever.